The second lesson is from the Old Testament book of Genesis. Let us listen for the word of God. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham took his wife Sarah and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Meet us where we are this day, O oh God, and open our hearts to you. Amen. There are some great examples of faith right around us. Once a young boy uh, saw the star, uh, story of starving children in Africa, a country that had been devastated by a drought. And so being moved by the story and their hunger, he decided to raise money by, by selling pictures for 50 cents apiece. So he knocked on the door of an elderly gentleman. The polite old soul uh, came to the door and asked the young boy what he was doing. He said he was uh, selling pictures because he was raising money for starving children. The man asked him, well, how much money are you trying to raise? He said with confidence, one million dollars. He says, well, I hope you're not doing this alone. The boy said, heck no, my sister is helping me. <laughs> now that's faith, right? James Whistler is remembered as one of America's great uh, painters. And when he was first married, he and his wife were so very poor that the only furniture they had was, uh, was a bed. But throughout their modest little house, Whistler and his wife took chalk and they sketched drawings on the floor uh, of the furniture that they hoped one day they would have. That's faith. So where are you on faith? Where are you when it comes to um, hoping for, when it comes to yearning for or clamoring for a faith that is deeper or stronger or more authentic? Or are you in a place where Maybe there was a time in your life where you knew your faith was vibrant and solid. But some things happened that, that didn't turn out all that well. And you wondered where God was in all of that. Or maybe it was that life just simply got so busy 
that uh, paying attention to God just went off the map. But that maybe there is some kind of faith on the back burner still. Or maybe faith for you is a matter of accepting certain beliefs or certain doctrines about God. But perhaps they don't seem to give you any real energy or power to live each day. So how's your faith? This sermon is for those who clamor for a deeper stronger faith and I start with one of the great symbols of faith the Jewish patriarch Abraham in today's scripture uh, God encounters Abraham and he tells him to to leave his country to leave his friends to leave his people and to go off into an unknown place Americans move on the average of seven times during our lifetime. So most of us know really how difficult it can be to to pull up our roots, to leave our home, to leave our friends, sometimes our work, and to move off. But Abraham, then called Abram, relied on his faith, moved out, moved ahead, And followed God's instructions. It was an act of faith. Renowned Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says, This is the beginning of Abraham's risky life. Risky life of faith. That God's call was a call for a dangerous departure from the presumed world of norms and security. So if we are asking questions about faith or looking for a model for what faith is or what it can be or how we can obtain it, Abraham is one we look to. I call Abraham's faith risky business because Abraham's faith was so rich and full of risk. You know, one of the things I sometimes think is that the reason we sometimes get stuck in the mud of a lackluster or unexciting or energy-less faith is because we think faith is a noun. That it's, a, that it's a set of principles uh, that we believe about God or a set of theological propositions that we sign off on. But the faith of Abraham and the faith of those we look up to who show us a kind of vibrant faith or, or the faith of Peter who tried walking on water When you look at their faith, they see faith as a verb, not a noun. Or as my grammar teachers uh, would say, it was an action verb. Which is to say that that faith is so much more than than believing. It's It's a movement of spirit, a progressive action, a reaching out, a trusting in God where our faith intersects in a dynamic way with the way we live and breathe. It gives us energy and direction. I once went to see a man who had been diagnosed with a, with a serious life-threatening disease. He was a church member, or at least he was on the rolls, but Truth is, I'd never seen him in church. When he told me about his illness, he said, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was a boy. In other words, 
he was letting me know that he was not worried about the state of his soul should his illness overtake him. But from what I could see, he had no interest in faith or church or God. Rather, I had this unmistakable sense that he was living in the shallow end of, uh, of the spiritual pool. For him, faith was a noun. No. Faith is a verb. And one of its primary ingredients is risk. Uh, David Viscott is a, a psychiatrist, and he's written a book uh, called Risking, I think. This is what he says. He says, taking a risk is central to everything worthwhile in life. Everything you really want in life involves taking a risk. To risk is to loosen your grip on the known and the certain. And to reach for something you're not entirely sure of. Yes. And that's certainly true in relationships, isn't it? I mean, risk is a part of relationships. I remember asking this girl out in, in high school. I was so nervous. I had gone over in my mind for days as to what I would say and how I would do it. And I stumbled through this, uh, this awkward invitation. And now, after 42 years of marriage, <laughs> I, I'd say the risk of being turned down was well worth it. Relationships are always about risk, right? I mean, have you ever ask somebody to forgive you? Or have you dared to, to reach out to someone who has hurt you or wounded you? Or you to them? Or tried to reconcile a relationship that has gone off the rails for whatever reason? I mean, that is risky business. Uh, does the name uh, Philippe Petit uh, ring a bell with you? He's a French high wire artist who gained fame now, uh, well, some years ago. He did some dramatic walks. His first was uh, a walk between the towers of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And then a few years later, it was between the then twin towers of the World Trade Center uh, in Manhattan. He was a thousand feet above ground. And he performed for 45 minutes on an August morning, walking, spinning, dancing, lying down on the wire, no safety net. He was arrested afterwards because... He didn't have a permit. I mean, he was not authorized to do such a thing. But they dropped the charges later when he agreed to do a children's performance in Central Park. Risky? Was it risky? He said not because of his practice and practice. But this is what he said in an interview that I thought was just fascinating. Some risk I find impossible to take, particularly personal risk with people, marriage, or having children. Well, he gets it, right? Our relationships sometimes feel more risky than, than walking a tightrope. Why? Because with any risk, there's always this danger a failure, which is to say that, that risk and failure are the twins of faith. But here's the most important thing 
the most important thing to understand. Our faith grows. Our faith deepens when we know that failure is a possibility, but we take a risky leap of faith anyway, trusting that God will see us through it. You know about Dyson vacuum cleaners? The man behind the company is a Brit, Sir James Dyson. He's a firm believer in failure. He sees failure as an essential part of success. When Dyson invented his first dual uh, cyclone uh, cleaner, he spent 15 years and created over 5 thousand versions that failed before he made one that worked. He says, you never learn from success. You do learn from failure. Risk and failure are the twins of faith. I think about some of the the risky ways that we have tested our faith here at First Press. Hot Dish and Hope was one of those uh, risky ventures where some of our folks had this crazy idea that we could help the homeless and the hungry of our city by opening our doors two nights a week for more than a hundred guests. Could we do it? Could we sustain it? Ten years and 500,000 meals later, I'd say the risk was worth it. Or when the culture shifted under our feet and some were looking for a more informal uh, worship service with eclectic music, Would button-down, steeped in tradition, First Presbyterian Church dare to venture into, into that world? Nine years later, our Rejoice service has been a meaningful addition to the worship life of our congregation. No risk, no reward. Or when we decided that our beautiful cathedral with its asbestos ceilings and antiquated heating and air and electrical systems needed to be brought into the 21st century and that our Smith building was tired and worn out. Could we risk a $15 million renovation after we had barely survived the Great Recession? Or when we started a residency program from, from, from scratch. Or the session deliberated for months on whether we should give our blessing to same-gender marriages. Or whether we could reconcile our relationship with emancipated slaves whose church had been born out of our balcony. I mean, all these circumstances were places where risk, faith, the possibility of failure, and trust were center stage. And you may have seen the news and record a week ago this past Saturday. It was on the front page. An apartment complex over on Summit Avenue had been condemned by the city. It was full of refugees who live on the edge of poverty and hopelessness. It was the same complex where a fire killed a refugee family and their children just last spring. The apartments were finally condemned by the city, and the tenants had no place to go. No money, no hope. But if you wonder what difference faith communities make in a city we saw it last week 
a dozen or so First Presbyterians organized by our outreach committee showed up on Thursday a week ago, a day before the tenants were to be turned on to the street. One of the families that our team targeted to help was from the Congo. The dad, Nikui Hitamana, gets on a van at 3.30 every morning and travels almost two hours to North Wilkesboro where he works in a chicken processing plant. His family had nowhere to go. Our team walked in and what they saw were the horrendous, miserable conditions in the condemned apartments. The apartments were dilapidated and in disrepair. One of our members said that when he pulled out the kitchen drawers, there were roaches everywhere. Not four or five, he said, 50 roaches. Our team worked all day to move several families over to apartments on the, on the other side of our city, apartments that you and I would probably say are modest. To those families, those apartments were a castle. At our session meeting uh, this Monday night, one of our elders, John Atkinson, who was a part of that team, read what that dad, Nikui Hitamana, the one who leaves for North Wilkesboro in the chicken processing plant every morning at 3.30. This is what he said to our, our team. He doesn't speak English, and he spoke through a translator. I am speechless for what these people have done for me. I feel like cry them, crying. Tell them I am a human being. I can't pay them for all you did, but God will recognize you for what you did. God's blessings for you all. God who gave you the courage to help people like me. That's what happens when faith becomes risky business.